that kind of evolved into rather than starting a national conversation on AI, you know, fielding questions and helping people understand what is this um, and making people understand, well, this is not just a little flash in the pan here. Like, you know, this is not just something that's going to go away. Patricia, last time we met, you were deep in the thickness of Soapbox. Now you've, you've left. It's an incredible story. People would look at it and think, what an incredible success. You were very, very thoughtful about building the business in a certain way. Now, in hindsight, that looks like an, a great idea, really, really comprehensive. You talked through, through every different box. Was there internal pressures to bring things to market faster? Was there different people that were actually saying, you know, you're doing it the wrong way, you're going to be left behind? Or how did you manage that? Uh, I think we were lucky in some ways that we were leading the field and our competitors at the time would have been the big tech companies and they were not paying attention to this area and that was kind of one of the reasons we knew it, it was a good thing to go after and we knew why it would have been difficult for them to go after versus us. And yes, there would have been all the time, like, no, why don't you just go out to Asia and get into all these English learning apps way before it was ready. Um, but our goal was for it to work in education and our goal was data privacy and equity uh, to have a work as well for all kids in the classroom. And and that stemmed from a couple of reasons. Our, you know, views as parents, a lot of us, the, the, you know, myself and, and, and my colleagues were parents, but also a good few people come from education and understand how important quality is. Um, I think when it comes to voice technology, voice AI that we were building, um, it depends. Um, you as an adult can decide what you want to do with your data privacy. We all feel much more sensitive about our children, their data, their what happens to them. Um, in an educational setting, if you introduced a voice technology into the classroom and it didn't work as well for everybody in the classroom, that's, it's, it's not ethical that it wouldn't work for a certain socioeconomic background or a certain accent. Uh, accent. Um, but also people just stop using it, you know. So um, if something is in your kitchen and it's not working for you, you will just stop using it. You may replace it with another product, you just stop using it. If it's going to be used in assessment in the classroom, it has to work. So there was an ethical uh, approach to this as well, that no child should have to suffer of getting something told they're wrong when they're right or the right when they're wrong, that damages confidence or educational outcomes. Um, but also, it, it commercially, how could a product succeed? So I actually often do scratch my head when I hear people not focusing on equity. It's like, so would you build a software product when you thought it didn't work for 50% of your, your target market? That sounds ridiculous. Why not just put in the effort so it works for 100% of your target market? So... On both fronts, we were very sure of what we were doing, um, you know, for, you know, to have longevity, to have a quality product. And to be honest, like to our, um, our, our time, you know, in Soapbox before we were acquired, we were considered the leading company in uh, ed tech. And US ed tech is a massive industry, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry that we would have been considered the gold standard for how this, and we raised the standard in that industry. So anybody else that has to compete has to demonstrate that they can compete with Soapbox technology, which is really, that feels good. Yeah. You must have felt so proud, but did you also feel like going over to the people who didn't back you and go, I told you so? <laughs> God, no, never be that petty. You know, um, no, I think, look, you know, I think this is the problem about innovation. If you're truly early, you're going to struggle to find people to understand, you know, and, and believe. And I think that's where many investors will get burnt sometimes to be following a trend or a hype and then uh, and miss out otherwise. Like, you know, I think there are some people who understand that and they look at, uh, you know, track record, background, stuff like that. And I'd always advocate the people when you're looking at deep tech, um, look at the background, look at the track record. Don't over-focus on the, the technology, you're not going to understand it. Um, seek out an expert in that field to do due diligence. And I really advise people do get them to show you something working. But, you know, to, you know, a lot a lot of the, re the refuses we got were, oh, my gut says no. And, you know, I think AI is peaked. I think voice technology is peaked. I don't really see this taking off. Like, And then, you know, there are many people who've worked in AI for years who have probably told you this same story that it was very difficult to get back in. Um, you know, you're beginning to see it about 2018, 2019, people a little bit more open, 2020 maybe. But really, wasn't until the chat GPT, and then people are, you know, 
So AI was, it, there was a drumbeat that was getting louder, maybe 2017, after Alexa and all those ones, you were beginning to see the potential. Um, and then that just like peaked uh, with ChatGPT. Tell me, what does a, an AI ambassador do? What is that, that role? What does that involve? So originally, I mean, I'm trying to remember how long it was. It's maybe three years now. Originally, the, the, the idea for that role was part of the government's AI strategy and it was around starting a national conversation on AI. You know, we think, but I think they was written maybe around the pandemic, early in the pandemic time, 2019, actually probably driven by the EU AI Act, which started yeah. in around 2018, 2019 that we need to, the country needs to understand AI, the public needs to understand AI, because it is going to be so much part of our lives. So even without the Gen AI, the LLMs, AI was, you know, we call it narrow AI or expert AI. That was actually, and, and that still would be mind-blowing today, even without the Gen AI, right? Because that's still a massive part of the AI scene that people forget. They think it's all Gen AI and it's not. Um, so that was starting. So we were trying to start, but then it kind of quickly flipped into maybe it was in, within a year ChatGPT was released and the the Pope Pope in the puffer coat, you know, the, the image and like just blowing everybody's mind. So then it was, it, that kind of evolved into rather than starting a national conversation on AI, you know, fielding questions and helping people understand what is this um, and making people understand, well, this is not just a little flash in the pan here. Like, you know, this is not just something that's going to go away and, and really trying to build that acceptance and understanding, which is still going on today. It's still, you know, we're still working on that, but it also became it was an AI, one AI ambassador did not make sense. So the, the idea was to build a, a whole council of experts because, you know, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not an ethics uh, expert. You know, I am an academic and an entrepreneur and engineer, but there were so many other sides to all of that, you know, different representations, different points of view, policy, you know, big tech, small tech, you know how it's going to affect all different industries is really, really important to get everybody around the table so we could together, you know, d deliver advice. What's the best part about your job? Um, it's really interesting to see how the machine works, like, you know, and watch from a different point, especially having been through it. I did, um, you know, I, di I did a PhD and went through academia and I got funded and then I went and worked in big tech for a few years and then I started my own company and I went through all the cycles of funding. So. To see it from the other side, I think is quite industry because interesting because this is something that's revolutionising. It's impacting every department in government. It's impacting all aspects of society. So um, it's seeing how it works and then trying to help where we can to to help inform, advise, shape. Have you been surprised at how quickly this has become mainstream? Yeah, blows my mind regularly still. I mean, not how much has become mainstream, the technology itself has blown my mind. I mean, even having worked in this got 25 years now, the rate of acceleration, that acceleration that's happening right now is mind blowing. If you were to say to most software engineers and even experts six months ago in September, where the coding aspect would, would be today, most people would have thought that was a lot longer, I mean, possibly years. So I think what we're seeing is new models dropping by the week and then everybody's scrambling to compare them. And, you know, I, overnight you could see a company's valuation just drop or, or catapult because of what's happening. Like, you know, and, and the amount of uncertainty is just huge. It's, it, it, it's a very unusual timeline. Please give me 30 seconds of your time. It blows my mind that only 9% of listeners actually subscribe to our podcast. I'm going to ask you one favor. If you like and enjoy this podcast, please can you subscribe? That one thing will really, really help us and the team get you the very, very best guests. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. So I believe that literacy... AI literacy is now probably one of the most important skills people can get. And, and I believe that. And I, I said last week, I believe AI is underhyped. And then quite a few people came back at kind of spears and said, you know, you're, you're off your chunk. But I genuinely believe as a business owner, if you start using this tool, you'll, min you'll save four hours a week guaranteed, potentially 12. It's, I know some people who are saving four hours a day using this tool. 
to 10x what they do. Where do you feel in the hype cycle? Is it underhyped, overhyped? Where are you feeling? Weirdly, it's both, right? It, it's overhyped, I think, in valuations. And I think, um, you know, in terms of the stock market and the, those big tech companies, and I think certain companies would want you to believe that it's game over, right? You know, and, and this is the way it is because it suits the narrative and especially it suits the amount of capital investment that's been put into these and is planned as well. Um, and they're out valuations and all that as well. So in some ways, it's been a frenzy in terms of valuations, right? So in some ways, that's been overhyped because I don't think we actually know who the winners are going to be. And I think very possibly the people we're talking about today may not be the people we're talking about in two years' time. Some of them might survive it. They won't all. Um, but I, I agree with you, I think, on the other side, because, you know, it's not just one conversation. It's a very complex, nuanced conversation. I agree with you. I think in a lot of parts, I think it's underhyped. Um, I think Sean Blanchfield uh, from Gentig had on recently enough, he's done a great blog post. And I think one phrase he said, you know, AI is not a department, it's how you're going to do business or it's how you should be doing business today. So I, I like that, that kind of, because I often talk about it with, with people in terms of sometimes people get confused and they think if you're AI, oh, I have to build an AI product or I have to use AI to, to accelerate my product or I have to sell something AI driven. But you're right, it's not. There's two different things. One thing is your product. Could you replace it? Could it, uh, a competitor catch up with you? You know, are you, is your product going to be decimated? Are you going to have so many more competitors because they can actually get to the point you are because of AI? And then it's across your whole operations. It's across your coding, your testing, your product development, design, market research, um, iterating, uh, customer, like kind of figuring out who your customers are. Like, your sales, your marketing, like there, there isn't an aspect of in the business that probably couldn't be touched. Finance, accounting, everything, HR, geez, you can go on and on and on. You have to be very careful in certain areas like HR because now we're getting into the UAI acting bit. You can't be, just a very quick check is, is the decision I'm making going to affect somebody's life? Like, you know, how I do something and then that's where the UAI act can come in. But other than that, I think very safely across most aspects of your business, you could figure out a way to accelerate, improve, optimize, and to be competitive. Because we're not in a, a, an Irish market. Most of us are in a global market, um, particularly in Ireland, actually. Um, if I don't look at it, and if I stick my head in the sand and hope it all goes away, um, my competitor won't. And then all of a sudden, you're not going to be able to deliver into the market like you used to. My challenge is if where leaders say, report back into me and let me know how that goes, where I believe those leaders have to immerse themselves in the technology to understand it themselves and get figure that out for the pyramid of the people, the process, product, having a safe place to use it. But then you have that proprietary data to start to leverage that. Because uh, what I am surprised, that I'm still surprised, how this AI was decimate a website that will clone us. It will then start to work on an SEO to try to build it up to Google, Google rankings where you felt like you had a competitive advantage and suddenly you don't. And when you meet the average show, so they've no idea what's happening in, in the background. From a step change perspective, do you think we need to have more focus on this across education to bring people on the journey? Or is it steady as it goes? Where, where do you uh, We released recommendations to the government uh, in February and very much AI literacy was definitely part of that um, for you know for everybody so yes of course we need to and it's a quite a simple thing to do people kind of like to think on okay that AI thing it's gone on too long now I'm going to feel stupid if I ask anything but it's actually not that hard you could go to chat GPT on your browser you can download an app and you could start and I would advise anybody the leadership at the top all the way down the board exec management everybody should be doing this uh, you can do it if you're sitting at home. You don't have to. Like if you're a farming, if you're, you know, anybody can do it. Download it or go to the website and just ask it to tell you something you don't understand. And I always do some explain simply and give it a concept or something that you've always struggled with or you'd love to understand a bit more. It could be about tariffs. It could be about whatever, right? And then ask it to explain something you think you know better than anyone else that you really do understand. Um, and then you can get it to explain, you can give it a scenario, you can get advice, you can get it to ask you questions to better iterate on on where you are. It's a really good educational tool. And if you do those few things, 
I think that's where it's going to blow your mind a little bit because it'll be disquieting when you realise the thing you thought you were an expert on. Oh, okay, now, okay, now I feel a little uncomfortable, but it's going to teach you something. And you're going, wow, I actually, I mean, I've literally done that in the middle of a meeting, like, you know, on a Zoom meeting, gone, like, somebody mentioned something, and rather than asking, I'm going to stop the meeting and asking, I'll just quickly get it to give me the, the 101 on what, what that term was or something. Yeah. And, and all you're leveling up, like, you know. And what you've done really well there is you've made it personalised to them. Because when people start to use it for themselves, when they've got a bit of skin in their own game, it brings it to life. Oh, yeah. And then when somebody comes to you with, your, somebody in your organisation comes to you with a plan about the data or whatever, you're going to feel better about understanding why that's needed. And if you don't, you go, let's talk about that again tomorrow. And then you get on ChatGPT and you query and I don't upload any sensitive information <laughs> that you need to. But you can actually go away and think about that plan and iterate and ask, you know, it, it, it could be that quiet mentor in the corner for you without you having to feel like you're, you know, stupid by asking people. It can do a lot of that work for you, like, you know. What number one piece of advice would you offer to entrepreneurs who are now going on a journey either for an AI product or weaving in AI across their business, become AI first in terms of how they approach problems? I would make sure that every hire, and you hire slowly now, like in carefully, either is on board with AI first, or, you know, they are, they're coming to you with how to do it in an AI first way, right? It doesn't matter whether it's in sales or marketing or ops or dev or, you know, or product, whatever, that they understand it or they're willing to do training. Because I don't think anybody, and if somebody says, no, no, that won't work in my, no, what I do now is too specialised yet. Like, because I, I know, like, you know, really senior devs all over the world in different places, they are using, there's no way that the person coming to you can't use it in some ways to optimise what they do. So get, they either are willing to learn or they're all, they already know and they bring that knowledge to you. Either way, I don't think anybody should be starting a start because it's so hard to get funding, right? Particularly in the world with a very, it's not very liquid at the moment. It may not be liquid for a while, depending on what's going on. You know, funding's going to get stretched. You need to start doing more with less. Um, you know, you still go to Enterprise Ireland, get your 100k safe, and you can probably get bits of it, small bits of fun. You need to look at that 100k or whatever you're getting, whether it's 50, 100 or 20, whatever you have, you need to squeeze that and go for as long as possible and demonstrate traction. And you should be able to do a hell of a lot more with less. So do not say, oh, yeah, yeah, and then we'll do AI later. No, just like from the get go, because, you know, I think everybody's going to have to pull back a little bit on uh, confidence about being able to raise funding into the future. Patricia Scanlon, AI Ambassador for Ireland, thank you very much for your time today. Hello, my name is Mark Kelly, founder of AI Ireland. We're passionate about collaboration and sharing the incredible stories behind every AI journey. That's why we're always looking for guests to join our in-person AI Ireland podcast experience. If you're working on innovative AI projects or have a story that can inspire others, we want to hear from you. This is your chance to share your insights, experiences and ideas with a really vibrant community that's as excited about AI as you are. So if you're ready to be part of this conversation and help shape the future of AI in Ireland, please get in touch today. We can't wait to collaborate with you. Thank you. Thank you.